road to success is like Harold and the Purple Crayon. You draw it for yourself. It was 1954. The summer heat had reached even a small town in Ontario. It was here in Capus Casing that Shirley and Philip Cameron welcomed their firstborn, James Francis. Barely out of diapers, he began to absorb his parents' interests. From his father, he inherited a love for science. Philip worked as an engineer at a local paper plant. From his mother, he inherited an artistic streak. Shirley had nearly become a professional painter, having won a district award in school for her painting of a blazing city. Later, Shirley trained as a nurse and after the birth of their third child, joined the Canadian Women's Army Corps, where she underwent full military training, cities in flames and battle-hardened resilience. In the future, James would repeatedly draw on his mother as a source of inspiration for the heroines in his movie. I bet. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's return to our hero's childhood. In 1971, the Camerons moved to Chippewa near Niagara Falls, where James gained three brothers and a sister. It was here that he started school, quite the adventure. They wanted to hold him back a year in his very first grade. His teacher thought he couldn't read because he simply stared out the window during every lesson. But James could read. He just found the school curriculum dreadfully boring. After a few tests, the school informed his parents that Jimmy would skip straight to the third grade. By the middle of his second year, he was moved up to the fourth grade. By ninth grade, James had turned the science fair into his personal trophy collection party and even became the president of the science club, though it only included one other member, a girl from Czechoslovakia. A teen two years younger than his classmates and a bookworm to boot? Jim got picked on every break. Soon he stopped attracting attention as school awards gave way to other pursuits. He read through the entire school history curriculum, studied world religions, and of course, was glued to the TV. But unlike his peers, he preferred watching Jacques-Yves Cousteau's explorations over cartoons or westerns. Another dive is over. We have made thousands in the 20 years since our curiosity first led us underwater. Frédéric Dumas and I, after all this time, still think it is a privilege to go down again and live for a while inside the sea. Never having seen the ocean, he dreamed of becoming an underwater camera operator. He absorbed Cousteau's philosophy, his love of nature, and fascination with the dark depths of our planet. James even convinced his parents to sign him up for a diving course in Buffalo where naval divers were trained. Philip couldn't grasp his son's unique interest and nudged him to pursue engineering, but despite his affinity for the sciences, James envisioned a different future, a future where all his passions converged. He even dabbled in writing a science fiction novel, though he quickly abandoned it. His burgeoning writing career was cut short by Stanley Kubrick, or more precisely, by his 2001 A Space Odyssey. Millions of years ago, before the human race existed, an adventure began, an adventure that ultimately leads man to confront his own destiny in an odyssey of exploration. I watched the film 18 times in its first couple of years of release, mm -hmm. all, all mm -hmm. in theaters. I remember at one, a guy ran down the aisle toward the screen screaming, it's God, it's God. Yeah. And he, he meant it in that moment. In the first year of the 21st century, there is strange and wondrous beauty, startling experiences that jolt and mystify, and the danger of complete obliteration. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this before. A single evening at the movies changed the young man's life. He finally knew what he wanted to dedicate his life to. For months, he imitated Kubrick, capturing anything that came into view of his friend's 8mm camera. Then one day, his father came home with life-changing news. Philip had been transferred to a paper plant in California. The family was to relocate just before the final semester of high school. Worried about uprooting their eldest son at such a crucial time, his parents feared that he would resent missing his prom. But Jimmy had just one request. Can we leave tomorrow? Brea is just a 30-mile hop southeast of Hollywood, so you'd think James would snag a film gig practically from his backyard. 
But even after moving there, his dream of breaking into the movies didn't seem any closer. Without the right connections, Brea felt as remote from Hollywood as Niagara Falls. So he signed up for classes at the local college, diving into physics and English literature, and picked up evening shifts as a machinist while still chasing his creative muse. He returned to writing sci-fi stories and even took up painting. It was his art that brought his first taste of success. A piercing portrait of a prisoner of war clutching at the bars which was chosen as an illustration for the POW MIA movement and displayed on billboards nationwide. Yet the film industry seemed in no rush to welcome him. Throughout his 20s, James did a bit of everything, janitor, truck driver, even pumping gas in the sweltering heat of the Mojave Desert. But films were never far from his mind. He kept on writing scripts and sketching out scenes, unknowingly amassing a treasure trove of ideas that would one day fuel his movies. Take his girlfriend, for example. She worked as a waitress at a local diner. Seemingly a simple job, but a decade later, she would inspire him to create Sarah Connor. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Patience, friends, all in good time. Star Wars, a billion years in the making, and it's coming to your galaxy this summer. In 1977, Star Wars swept half of America off of its feet. 23-year-old Cameron was no exception, deeply impressed by George Lucas and his team. However, James didn't plan on dressing up as Han Solo or swinging a stick around making lightsaber noises. Like 2001 A Space Odyssey, the tale of the Jedi inspired him to pick up a camera. But this time, he wasn't thinking small. Along with some college buddies, he planned to shoot their own space epic, Xenogenesis. Opportunity knocked when a friend's dad, an accountant for a dentist association looking to invest, invited them to pitch to his client. They made him a machine trained to deliver humanity from the final cataclysm. She was raised by a machine that alone knew the power of love. Together, they searched the wilderness of stars for a place where the cycle of creation could begin again. Xenogenesis an ultimate adventure. When James pitched his space epic to a group, they saw dollar signs instead of stars and quickly wrote a check for $30,000. They didn't understand that we were so far out of the orbit of any normal filmmaking environment that a grip on the cheesiest film knew more than we did. Cameron made up for his lack of experience with a hefty dose of determination. They secured an industrial area near the Orange County Airport as their shooting location. And rather than attending formal courses, they used a pile of film books from the local library to master set design and special effects. Armed with just utility knives and cardboard, they dove into creating new worlds. When it came time to rent a camera, they needed a quick tutorial on how to load the film. Despite the overwhelming odds, the team managed to pull off some seriously impressive tricks. They nailed it with miniatures and composite shots animating laser beams frame by frame, and they really excelled with robots. Cameron would later draw on these early creations for the tech in Aliens and the Terminator. Considering that Xenogenesis was made by, to put it mildly, amateurs is truly remarkable. However, they only managed to shoot about 12 minutes of it, not exactly a full feature film. No surprise the dentists were ticked off. They were hoping for a blockbuster, not just a portfolio piece. But Cameron? He was clever with it. He took that short reel over to Roger Corman's office, who, you won't believe this, was about to shoot the next Star Wars on a shoestring, or rather, a knockoff titled Battle Beyond the Stars. New World has had several profitable years, and we're now starting to make more expensive films, and we're climbing once more. Corman was a filmmaking factory. He cranked out over 400 films, always sticking to his cheap and quick mantra. This approach and his love for shoestring budgets had attracted budding filmmakers for decades. Titans like Nicholson, Bogdanovich, Coppola, and Scorsese all started under Roger's tutelage, but lately, big studios had been cribbing his style. They bet on young directors and tiny budgets, hoping to strike gold with a new Spielberg. To stay competitive, Corman set his sights on his magnum opus, a remake of Kurosawa's Seven Samurai in space with a $2 million budget. Ruthless invaders, 
a defenseless planet. A lone youth escapes on a last-ditch mission that begins at the edge of the universe. Pretty impressive. He even set up a special effects department in his studio for this beast. And the new director of that department brought Cameron on board as a model and miniature designer. When Jim got to work, all the spaceship designs were ready except one, the ship piloted by a female robot. This isn't going to be just another planetary joyride, you know. I know that, now. I'll do my best not to let you down. It was this design he was hammering out when Gail Ann Hurd, Corman's young assistant, who would later become Cameron's wife and filmmaking partner, walked into the workshop. She spent about three or four days there, came back, and she said, you're falling behind in special effects, and the problem is your top special effects people are not really that good. The youngest, newest guy in special effects is actually the best. That was Jim Cameron, and I said, promote Jim today. From there, Cameron's career shot up like a rocket. After impressing Roger with his concept for a spaceship with tits. See what I mean? He got bumped up to head of ship design. Just weeks later, Corman fired the film's art director who hadn't produced a single sketch in a month. Cameron stepped in with his own designs that day and snagged the spot. Jim learned fast that Corman's method tolerated no delays. If the crew was on set, you were shooting, no matter if things weren't quite painted or the floor was still a mess. Move it! Kick ass, boys! Kick ass! After the chaos, which Corman proudly called a film shoot, wrapped, Cameron went off to apply his newfound skills everywhere he could. He helped design skyscrapers for Carpenter's Escape from New York and moved on to another Corman project, Galaxy of Terror. Or as it should really be called, a cheap ripoff of Alien. It's been waiting a billion years to scare you to death. Trap in a living maze of terror. The ultimate horror in space. Cameron was tasked with mimicking H.R. Geiger's iconic design on a budget barely bigger than Geiger's daily coffee tab. It was a tough job, and the results didn't exactly wow Roger. Corman grew frustrated with the director and his team, who seemed to shoot the sets in the worst ways possible. The decorator pointed this out to Corman and suggested shooting the close-ups himself. Uh, and I just basically went up to Roger one day and said I'd like to direct second unit. And um, he gave me a camera and a couple, two or three people, and we started a little second unit. And the second unit basically became this steamroller that wound up shooting about a third of the picture. His debut shot as the director featured a severed hand from which maggots were supposed to emerge. They used mealworms instead, which, true to form for actors under a rookie director, were too lazy to move. It seems even worms needed a motivational shock to get into character, which Cameron provided with a splash of liquid and a jolt of electricity. It was during this spectacle that the producers of Piranha 2 who were originally scouting for a production designer, stumbled upon a director who could make even worms act. Sleek, fierce, savage, deadly. A super breed of killer fish that can swim, fly, and attack at any time. The new breed is here. Faster, more ferocious, and infinitely more deadly. Piranha 2, you are not safe out of the water. If I didn't have so much to drink tonight, I'd swear I was seeing things. Did you miss out on the Piranha sequel? Don't sweat it. Let's give you a quick refresher. Two diving enthusiasts become a snack for a mysterious creature. A local biologist and diving instructor try to warn the hotel guest and the administration of the annual fishing contest about the lurking monster. Piranha. But the allure of the warm Caribbean sea and the thrill of casting a line are too tempting to resist. We want this. The biologist figures out that the culprits are genetically modified piranhas. The ultimate killer organism. And now not only shrug off salt water, but have sprouted wings to boot. <laughs> Flying bloodthirsty fish. Well, you can guess what happens next, even if you're not a big slasher fan. <coughs> to get 
why Cameron got sucked into this mess of silliness and gore, let's first meet Ovidio Asinitis, the notorious Italian producer. Back in 77, he directed the horror flick Tentacles, and three years later, he pretty much ripped off the omen with this movie, The Visitor. Warner Brothers, the American investors, would only fork over the cash if Ovidio agreed to hire an American director. They figured this would balance out the flamboyant European producer and ensure the film appealed to U.S. audiences. I can't figure out why I came to a small island for my vacation. I mean, I live on a small island. Oh, really? Which one? Manhattan. Asinitis would agree bring on an inexpensive newbie, let them get through the pre-production, and then a couple of days into shooting, he'd fire them for incompetence and finish the film himself. Oh, Christ. This trick worked twice before, so for Piranha, which was funded with a half a million, they found their third sucker, James Cameron. He put me with an Italian crew who spoke no English, even though I was assured that they would all speak English. And I actually had to learn some, some Italian very quickly. Naive and thrilled about the chance to direct his own film, James jetted off to Rome. He signed the contract, pocketed $5,000 in advance, worked on the script and storyboards, then flew out to Jamaica where Ovidio's team was supposed to be gearing up to shoot. But he found their prep was laughably slack. With only a week to go, they hadn't scouted a single location. Cameron hired a taxi and spent a whole day racing around the city, making deals with a hotel, police station, and the local morgue. Ooh, this is the morgue. Very good. But there was a hitch at the morgue. James assumed they'd clear out the, let's say, occupants? <laughs> but the staff left everything as it was. So the scene was literally separated from realism by a thin divider behind which lay real gore. During the crew's lunch break, pathologists took one body splashing blood on the floor. Cameron asked the actors to hang tight and, not wanting to freak out his crew, cleaned up the mess himself. No damn respect. Isn't that right, love? Amidst the chaos, though, you could see glimmers of the filmmaker Cameron would become. If you squint hard, you could spot elements reminiscent of aliens and the abyss. Techniques that would later animate face huggers, Cameron's fascination with water, and even a familiar face. Lance Henriksen, who played the sheriff, struck up a friendship with James between takes and would soon receive more than one casting call from him. It must be something we haven't seen yet. But back then, Cameron being a director was as far-fetched as piranha matching Jaws in a clam. Just five days after filming started, he got a call from Rome. He was fired. Ovidio had reviewed the footage and declared it uneditable. Well, now what else could it be? Huh? <laughs> Realizing he'd been conned, Cameron demanded his name be removed from the credits. But the name was the only thing the producer wanted from him. So the ex-director got the cold shoulder. <laughs> Come on, <asshole>. <laughs> <laughs> he basically came in and said, your stuff doesn't work, doesn't cut together, it's a pile of junk, and you're off the movie. And then he took over the film. So I took over, and I asked him to stay next to me <coughs> up to the end of the movie and to to learn. And he did it. I mean, okay, maybe. Maybe I'm just bad. Maybe I'm just not good. And, of course, he was very upset about it. He was suffering a lot. But, you know, we are not playing games. No. We're making movies. Uh, or we're not at school. Half a year later, Cameron scraped together enough to buy a one-way ticket to Rome. His mission? to convince Ovidio to show him the final cut of the film they'd snatched away. If his scenes were really that bad, he could stop torturing himself with doubt and peacefully return to designing spaceships with tits. And he wouldn't show me any of the film. And I had been in Rome prepping the film for a couple of weeks before we went, and I remembered the code to, to get in. And so um, I went in and I just ran the film for myself. It wasn't that bad. His scenes were just as good as he'd imagined. It was Asinidi's creativity that had tanked the film, stuffing the reel with topless women on yachts and giving them the lion's share of screen time. Sounds great. Imagine having your name forever linked to such a nightmare. Worse than anything, the film's characters endured. And so, and I made a few changes <laughs> before I flew back, which I don't know if they ever caught. I, I don't know if the editor ever noticed that I actually fixed a couple things. Sneaking into the editing room at night, he spent a month in Rome doing this, surviving on leftovers he swiped from trays outside hotel rooms. There he also suffered one of the worst fevers of his life, 
hallucinating about a chrome torso with a red eye emerging from flames. Hmm, this is fucking great. Cameron's efforts to save the edit were in vain. Ovidio Asenita showed his cut of the film to Warner Brothers, who were horrified and promptly rejected it. The film would eventually surface two years later, released by a small outfit mainly known for churning out adult films. Decades later, Cameron would half-jokingly call Piranhas the greatest flying fish movie ever made and perfect for cracking open a cold one. It's a gift from the sea. But back in the spring of 1982, laughter was the last thing on his mind. Strapped for cash, he borrowed some money for a plane ticket and headed back to California, armed with a sketch of an original idea inspired by a bout with the flu. Fresh off the plane from Europe and drowning in debt, Cameron drove an old beater handed down by his father to Bill Wisher's place. Jim and I met in the early 70s, 73, I think, and there weren't that many people in the town who were interested in, you know, science fiction and, and all that kind of stuff. After countless hours spent watching movies together and dissecting them afterward, they teamed up to work on Xenogenesis. Yeah, saw Bill had the best ears James could count on to pitch his idea. That evening, they decided to team up on the screenplay. What he was looking to do was to write something uh, that would be so irresistible that no one would not let him direct it. Wisher took on the early scenes, introducing Sarah Connor and the police station shootout while Cameron tackled the rest. Then Cameron shared the idea with his agent. These ears, however, did not appreciate the concept and the mouth suggested forgetting this nonsense and coming up with something else. The meeting ended with the agent's dismissal. I think that you have to find some kind of inner strength that says what I'm doing is right. Gail Ann Hurd, once Roger Corman's assistant and a fellow veteran of B-movie battles with Cameron, was the third person to hear about the Terminator. Um, I knew Gail it was the type of material that she knew and that she understood and she knew low budget effects. So she was a natural choice. After Cameron's departure from Corman's studio, Heard had climbed the ranks from production assistant to full-fledged producer on several cheap flicks. She saw something special in Cameron's pitch and offered to produce the movie. We decided that we would collaborate on the film and bring it to the screen. In a deal that was practically a steal, she bought the screenplay rights for just $1 promising Cameron that not only would the movie be made, but he would also direct it. It was a bargain that would catapult Cameron's career, although it meant he'd barely earn a dime from the franchise's future spoils. No action figures, video games, or theme park rides revenue. Cameron would later refer to this contract as his crash course in Hollywood economics. Rewind to 1982, when theme parks were the least of Cameron's worries. I wouldn't sell the script unless I went with it as the director, and of course that was a turnoff for almost everybody. We were turned down by every major studio. However, we did have one connection to Orion Pictures. Barbara Boyle and Francis Dole, who had worked for Roger Corman at New World Pictures, were both employed by Mike Medavoy and we slipped the script to them, and they loved it. Ever the resourceful producer, Heard managed to get Orion Pictures on board to distribute the film, provided she found someone to back the production. Landing a distributor is usually tougher than finding a producer since it almost guarantees some return on investment. That's why Hemdale Pictures decided to join the venture. They weren't expecting a masterpiece, they just wanted a slice of the box office pie. But after Cameron flooded the head of the company with sketches and detailed descriptions of a dystopian future filled with robots, they teamed up with HBO and nailed down a budget of $6 million. This is brilliant. Next up was casting. Kyle Reese was first up, the rugged rebel dedicated to defeating machines, yet still possessing a tenderness that wins over Sarah Connor. Orion Pictures was on the lookout for a charismatic rising star, someone recognizable in Europe as well. Curiously, the execs at Orion saw their ideal heroic lover in a towering figure of muscles, a man who had risen to fame through the pumping iron dock. I mean, it's terrific, right? <laughs> so, you know, I'm in heaven. At a glitzy Hollywood party, an Orion executive bumped into Arnold Schwarzenegger and, struck by his physical presence, promised to send him the script for The Terminator. Arnold was intrigued by the story and agreed to meet with the director. Cameron, however, was blindsided by the suggestion. Fine. 
I hope he is. The notion of Schwarzenegger as Reese seemed so off base that he agreed to lunch with Mr. Olympia primarily to keep his superiors happy. Mike Metavoy called up and said I had to talk to Arnold to play Reese. I thought, okay, that's fine. That's a lame idea, frankly, but uh, but I'll talk to him. Over a lunch, cloaked in more cigar smoke than a detective novel, they swapped tales about motorcycles and weaponry. As Cameron took in Arnold's chiseled jaw and intense stare, a light bulb went off. Arnold is Reese? Absolutely not. But as the Terminator? Bingo. Uh, I came back to John Daly and said, look, it's not gonna work as Reese, uh, but I think he'd make a great Terminator. You then did something really smart. You sent over to my office your painting mm -hmm. that you did of Terminator. Right. And I looked at this painting and I said, I am the Terminator. <laughs> and I called Lou, right. uh, my agent, right away, and I called you and I said, I want to play the Terminator. Yeah. And then the deal was made. Previously, Cameron had imagined the machines as kind of a spy with a forgettable face who could easily infiltrate the rebels. The Terminator I always saw as this kind of cipher, this kind of anonymous guy. He thought Henriksen, the sheriff from Piranha 2, was perfect, but in Arnold's emotionless gaze, he saw something more compelling. This epiphany not only shifted Lance to the role of Detective Vukovic, same shit, but also robbed another muscular guy of the role of a lifetime. And believe it or not, O.J. Simpson was at one point brought up to stars the Terminator. No one was really hooked to O.J. Simpson playing Terminator because he could not be sold as a killing machine. <laughs> yeah. Securing Schwarzenegger meant that filming would be delayed for at least a year and a half, as the actor was already preparing for his role in Conan the Barbarian. We wound up in a, in a one-year holding pattern, during which I practically starved to death. You know, my mom was sending me coupons in the mail that allowed me to buy two Big Macs for the price of one, and using you know cost-saving techniques like this, which proved beneficial once we actually started making the film, I was able to survive long enough to begin production. Although Cameron was anxious, he had plenty to keep him busy. The role of Kyle Reese was given to the up-and-coming Michael Bain. Uh, it's a very complex character uh, because at the beginning we, we look at him as a as a villain because he's going through the same movements and the same the same pattern of action as uh, as the Terminator. But then he has to change and become the hero, and then beyond the hero, he has to become the romantic lead, if you will. So there's a transmigration of the character that happens. This is great stuff. I could make a career out of this guy. Michael came in to, to read for us, and he gave the best reading of, of, of any of the actors that we'd seen, but it was with a southern accent. And uh, we talked to his agent, very politely said, you know, Michael's very good, but, but we really don't want him to, to seem so specific that he comes from the South. And myself and my agents were like, well, what are you talking about? You know, I'm not southern. I'm from Nebraska. You know, that's middle America, you know. It, it turned out that he'd been reading for Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. The, the morning, you know, that morning of, of, the, of the reading, and he hadn't shaken the accent. I used to always wonder what you were thinking at that moment. The last major role to be filled was that of humanity's savior mother, Sarah Connor. When we met Linda, she also had the ability to transcend the genre and not be someone who simply screams really well, but someone who was believable as the girl next door who could ultimately become the mother who saves humanity. And that's not an easy transition. Boy, that's a tough one. To keep busy while waiting for Arnold to wrap up his sword swinging duties in Conan, Cameron polished the Terminator script and pitched new project ideas to producers. Geiler and Hill's Brandywine Productions, who had the rights to a couple of sequels and were planning a Spartacus remake set in space, were not moved by Cameron's pitch about sandals and gladiators in the cosmos. As a parting suggestion, they urged him to consider an idea for a sequel to Alien, the very film that had redefined science fiction and which had inspired Cameron to pen his own script over a year earlier after working on a low-budget ripoff at Corman Studio. What a magnificent piece of work. So I asked him if he wanted to write that, and uh, yeah, he did. <laughs> a week later, Cameron returned to Geiler and Hill's office essentially with a complete film in hand and was immediately hired to write the screenplay for Alien. On that same busy day, he was also tasked with writing a less ambitious but decently paid sequel for Rambo. 
Thanks. Within three months, Cameron was expected to finalize the Terminator, turn dark corridors of LV-426 into a xenomorph petting zoo, and send Stallone back for another sun-soaked tour in Vietnam. Think you can handle it? Try it. That last gig stumbled a bit. Cameron was all set to pin a Rambo that mused on the existential dread of war, but Stallone was more in the mood for explosions and one-liners. Plus, Sly complained that all the juiciest lines were being hogged by the extras. When he co-wrote Rambo along with Stallone, and I think that uh, Cameron would tell you that uh, most of what ended up on the screen is what Stallone wrote, I think. Yeah. The whirlwind of revisions was so intense that Cameron only managed to write only 90 pages for Aliens before it was time to head to his own film set. Fortunately, those 90 pages so impressed 20th Century Fox that they agreed to wait for the final draft and even promised Cameron the director's chair if his debut film would be successful. Wait. I don't want to know. The final prep for The Terminator involved putting together a visual effects team which, given the tight budget, meant they had to get pretty creative. Fantasy II film effects was brought on board for the miniatures and stop-motion animation. The devastated future world was contained within a mere 150 square feet. We first built a three-foot platform, which uh, all the miniatures would be shot on. And in the background were cutouts of, of ruined cities, and in the foregrounds you had ruined buildings and skulls and things of that, that nature. Good old force perspective came in handy here. Skulls in the foreground were normal size, while those in the distance were no bigger than peas set against tiny ruins. There was even a grenade on the set the size of a pin cap, filmed in slow motion to visually enhance its weight, making it appear more realistic and substantial. And to try and get it to go directly underneath the treads was a, was a pain in the ass. <laughs> I think we got it on, on the 26th take. Just one hunter killer model was built. Hunter killers, patrol machines built in automated factories. Any slight movement would sway it, ruining the tape. So dozens of attempts were needed before this flying monster soared convincingly. The robot models were many too, with early CGI whizzes handling the laser shots. And not just a, just a single line that glowed, he wanted them to have a lot of depth, complexity. He had a color that he was really working for. These tech pioneers also managed the command line interface from the Terminator POV. According to this interface, the Terminator's brain is powered by an MOS 6502 chip. That's the same as in the Apple II computer. So if machines ever start a war, we know who gave them their brains. Um, sure. But let's return to the special effects. Resistance fighters were added into scenes using rear projection. Pre-filmed material was projected onto a screen while actors performed with a minimal set. The same method was used for scenes featuring Sarah Connor fleeing from an explosion. Jim Cameron originally wanted to blow this a full-size tanker truck up, but he couldn't because where he was shooting it in downtown Los Angeles was in front of the police armory. So what Gene had to do was create the entire atmosphere in miniature, one six scale, in the front of the parking lot of Fantasy II in Burbank, and then blow up a miniature tanker truck. The end of the explosion had to match what had already been shot 10 days before in principle. So we had to blow it up and have it end up looking like the wreckage. The first time we tried this, the gas was loaded, the bombs were loaded, the wiring was all done, the cameras are ready. We've got three cameras on it and we're shooting 120 frames per second. Lights were ready, everything is ready. And what happened was the cable that was attached to the front axle pulled it so hard that it just ripped it out from underneath the cab and there are the wheels and I'd already started setting off the explosion so I had to set it off the rest of the way. We put it out and there was a a collective groan amongst everybody on the set. So we then right away started working on another model and two days later we got the shot. While Fantasy II film effects certainly brought their A-game to the set of the Terminator, 
they weren't the wizards behind the real magic. James knew that the key to the film's success lay in the seamless blend of makeup and animatronics. And when it came to the top dog in this field, nobody held a candle to Dick Smith. This guy scared the pants off of audiences in The Exorcist, transformed Brando into Vito Corleone, and splattered squibs of fake blood all over the sets of Taxi Driver, The Deer Hunter, and a slew of other iconic flicks. He was the one who agreed to talk with us, read the script, and then said, you know, I'm not the right guy for this. The right guy for this is Stan Winston. Recently Oscar nominated for the quirky Heartbeats. Some people use a Rolls Royce to plow turnips. Though initially skeptical, it was Stan Winston who would turn Cameron's wild fantasies into tangible realities. They would become not just collaborators, but comrades in arms, eventually founding a visual effects studio peppered with Academy Awards in Stan's workshop. And I was extremely fortunate in that I had an amazingly talented uh, group of guys to work with, uh, whose names will remain off the screen and no one will ever know who they are because I'm taking all the credit. But back in 82, those glory days were still far on the horizon. Cameron first dazzled Winston with robot sketches so detailed they looked like ready to build blueprint. Stan joked that James was the best artist who ever worked for him. Jim, I honestly, why don't you give me a little sketch here and sort of milk out the sketches from uh, from Jim Cameron. Go, okay, we'll work on that. And then I could go over to the guys and say, we're done, we got it. Let's just, here's, here's the body cavity and here are the hips and here's the shoulder. And uh, by the time all was said and done, uh, Jim had sketched every detail of, of the endoskeleton and, uh, and thank God for him. And then I ended up taking credit for it all, which I will continue to do. In scenes where the machine self-repairs and pops out an eye, animatronics controlled by a skilled team of puppeteers took the stage. Though today that head might not win any awards for realism, back in 84, it chilled and thrilled in equal measure. A couple of sculptures were actually done. We used one of them in the truck at the end when he was driving. I will be looking at photographs and I myself would ask myself, is this me or is this the dummy? And only and, and, and out of 10 times uh, when I was asked the question, I, mu I must have been wrong six or seven times. So this is how close this was or exactly a resemblance of my face. So it was really, it was really amazing. Even in a film, there was no way of telling. The interesting thing is, is that as good as the heads turned out, the makeup turned out actually better than we thought it would. And I think allowed Jim some more freedom as a filmmaker to shoot for Arn to be able to act more. Get out. And then a couple of close-up shots just to sell the depth inside that skull. And we made a huge oversized uh, endo eye area that we used for close-ups for the eye operation and also allowed us to show the irising using a actually a camera lens for that piece. So those were all the, the various pieces that we used for the endo. And the scene that truly steals the show is when the Terminator, let's just say, steps out of his skin. For the wider shots, they restored a stop-motion animation. Despite their best efforts, the 100-foot main puppet just wouldn't walk on its own. However, the stop-motion looked so unreal that Cameron kept it to a minimum. Instead, they crafted separate models of different robot body parts, which, through clever editing, made its existence believable on screen knew that we could get some walking and some movement by creating an upper torso puppet of the Terminator that would be carried on the shoulders of a puppeteer who affected his walk and his and his limp and his dragging leg. Then we added our animatronic techniques to head and eye movement. We also built a full standing endoskeleton that uh, Jim could shoot from head to toe and the shots where he's blown in half and he's being dragged along. As far as the rigs we had, we had mechanical insert arms uh, we developed our first robotic hands, which we would use as inserts and grab the grating and pull them forward. But we also had our exploding dummy uh, endo. It was a urethane, and the reason we had to make it out of urethane and we chromed that urethane was from a safety factor. We didn't want metal pieces, uh, you know, killing uh, all of the, the people on the set. In addition to the challenges of bringing the director's visions to life, there were also mundane problems. You know, we shot 
downtown LA, the worst parts of LA, at night, during the summer. So it was hot, it was humid, it was dirty, smelly, all those alleys and stuff, it was nasty. But it worked, it worked for the movie. Right before we started shooting, Linda Hamilton broke her ankle and we were concerned and that she'd be able to actually carry out the performance that was essential. The schedule had to be rearranged so that scenes requiring her to run were shot last. Even walking was a struggle, but fortunately, she didn't have to act in moments where she was in pain. <laughs> Later, Arnold struggled with a shot involving a motorcycle turn, so Cameron himself jumped on the bike and demonstrated how to do it. Schwarzenegger wasn't asked to do much. In most of the action scenes, a stunt double wearing a Terminator mask replaced him. This was Peter Kent's first job in Hollywood. I was sent out to meet James Cameron for a, as a lighting stand-in. Okay. And then Jim took a look at me and said, you have the job. Um, by the way, have you done stunts before? And I said, gee, I may not have this job if I don't say yes. And basically that was it. And I walked into the set and he was sitting in the corner and he looked at me up and down and he said, nah, too tall. And so I figured that, you know, that was the end of my job. And I turned around, he goes, I'm just joking. Sit down here and have a cigar. The next thing I found myself on set being asked to fly through windows and get set on fire. You know, the coordinator eventually sussed me out and said, you have no idea what you're doing, do you? And, and that basically saved my life because he helped train me. The final stage of production was the soundtrack by composer Brad Fiedel. He did the whole score in his garage. It was a cool garage. I mean, he had a lot of good gear. Some of the most advanced devices of the time played the opening theme, The Machine's Heartbeat. Part of the nature of the score is me trying to get control of the machines. <laughs> While the machines are trying to get control of the people in the movie, I'm sitting here desperately trying to get control of these machines. So if my Prophet 10 was going, boom, 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 and the other thing was going, Indeed, Cameron managed to make a real film, not some piranha flick or Star Wars knockoff, but something truly significant. That's why the reaction from Orion Pictures felt like a slap. The studio perceived it as a down and dirty action exploitation film. Like a Charles Bronson film, one week in and out. Crazy son of a bitch. I made the statement that as a science fiction film, we should sell it on its own merits because that's a very particular audience. He said, this is not a science fiction film. You can't sell this as a science fiction film. Star Wars is science fiction. If you promise that, people are going to feel betrayed. If they go into the theater and you're telling them it's science fiction and it's this. I said, well, it does involve time travel and robots, two of the, the biggest mainstays of science fiction. All science fiction films aren't necessarily about space travel. He didn't get it. Shut up! You still don't get it, do you? Fearing that reviews would destroy its commercial potential, they held only one press screening and limited the advertising campaign to just seven days. However, the few critics who did catch the show kicked off a wave of applause. The Los Angeles Times praised the thriller and its ferocity. Similar reactions came from the New York Times and Newsweek. And Time Magazine even added The Terminator to its list of the top 10 films of the year. It was impossible to anticipate that the film would get the kind of almost universal positive reviews that we got and that the film would open up and maintain the same box office week in and week out for a number of weeks. Raking in about $80 million worldwide on a shoestring budget of $6 million. What was once pegged as potential B-movie fodder morphed into bona fide sensation, later becoming a VHS titan that eclipsed its theatrical earnings. By 2008, The Terminator had been enshrined in the National Film Registry as an unequivocal classic. When I wrote it, I probably thought it had stood the chance of being a success. I wrote it that way on purpose, you know, but you never really believe that, it, that it's going to happen. Cameron, meanwhile, soaked up the acclaim, tied the knot with Gail Ann Hurd, gave countless interviews, and cue the dramatic music, faced an accusation of plagiarism. No. Oh. The thorn in this tale? Harlan Ellison, who was convinced that Cameron had stolen his ideas from two episodes of the TV series Outer Limits. Some years ago, uh, before Terminator came out, I began to hear from people, gee, the, the script 
that they were going to shoot that reads an awful like a lot your uh, like your script for Soldier that you did on Outer Limits years ago. Between the future warriors of Soldier accidentally time traveling to our era and the mechanical hand in Demon with a glass hand that seemed to prefigure the Terminator, Ellison saw more than a coincidence. So we went to uh, at this point we went to Hemdale and Orion and we said. Uh, I'm afraid we got him with the smoking gun. Now, do you want to do something about this, or do you want us to to whip your ass in open court? I mean, perfectly happy to do it either way. Well, they settled. Orion decided to cut Ellison a check and tack his name onto the credits to avoid a fuss. Cameron, none too pleased with this peace offering, didn't yet have the Hollywood heft to throw his weight around. Years later, his verdict on the matter was blunt and unapologetic. Harlan Ellison is a parasite who can kiss my ass. Fuck you, asshole. Go ahead and terminate that like button and leave a comment below. Not for us, but to fight the machine, or algorithms in this case. It can't be bargained with. It can't be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity. The Terminator was a hit. And while enjoying his honeymoon, Cameron was simultaneously finalizing the script for the Alien sequel. The studio stayed true to their word and secured him as the director. If Terminator hadn't been such a success when it premiered, I doubt that, that Jim would have been brought on to direct. Moreover, Ridley Scott preferred to shoot unicorns and Tom Cruise as a forest boy over the dark tunnels of LV-426. Be careful. Let's face it, in the 80s, sequels were the reheated leftovers of the cinema fridge. Everyone wants a sequel now. Back then, that was... Really, much more of an anomaly. Don't do that because, you know, anything that's good in your movie will be attributed to Ridley, and anything that's bad will be attributed to you. It's a no-win scenario. Something Cameron knew all too well, given his own venture in skewering Piranha. However, in this case, he took a different approach. It made little sense to echo Scott's vision. Topping the original's horror was nearly impossible. <laughs> In the first movie, Ridley introduced a near-indestructible killing machine that terrified anyone unlucky enough to cross its path. So I had to come up with, I had to come up with an end run around that that would be equally entertaining for an audience, but in a different way. And to do that, we had to offer something in its place, which was an excitement factor or, a, or an exhilaration or something else, some other emotion. The sequel would shift gears toward action featuring not-so-invincible monsters, spectacular special effects, and a metaphor for the Vietnam War? What? Yes, it's not exactly subtle. Good morning! LV-426. Consider this. The plot features a squad of heavily armed, tough Marines descending from the heavens in a spacecraft, much like a helicopter, intent on clearing out the dark, alien-filled corridors of a foreign land. Sound familiar? Just as in Vietnam, their brashness and underestimation of the locals led to dire consequences. Do you get it? To me, though, the whole Vietnam experience was almost science fictional in the sense that it was the first real high-tech war that was waged against an extremely low-tech enemy and lost. These twists helped snag Sigourney Weaver's interest, especially since she initially had no intention of reprising her role. Fox played a tricky game with Cameron, on one hand allocated a generous budget of $18.5 million and allowed him to appoint Gail Ann Hurd as producer, despite some concerns about entrusting such an expensive project to newlyweds. But then Cameron discovered that Weaver wasn't even under contract yet. In fact, they hadn't bothered to contact her. I don't understand this. The script, written specifically for her, was approved and pre-production was underway. Yet the star of the show hadn't even heard about the film. I was making a film in France and I suddenly got this complete finished script that was all about Ripley. I remember thinking, I can't believe that no one even mentioned it to me, but I mean, I was thrilled. Weaver was captivated by the author's fresh perspective, but made it clear it was time for Fox to show her the money. Then there became a contract negotiation in which Fox was not necessarily willing to pay her the amount of money that she wanted. To move things along, Cameron floated a rumor about replacing Ripley. Did IQs just drop sharply while I was away? This tactic jolted both Weaver, who saw the sequel's potential, and Fox, who had fallen in love with the original script. A few days later, they struck a deal. Weaver would receive a million dollars for Aliens, 30 times what she earned for the original. 
right, I'm in. It's not easy being the only human on a distant planet to survive an alien attack. Now imagine doing that and being nine years old. That's the task Carrie Henn faces as Newt in the new movie Aliens. Take a look at her work at work with co-star Sigourney Weaver. My mommy always said there were no monsters, no real ones, but there are. Yes, there are. We found that the children who had a great deal of acting experience had mostly acted in commercials. And whenever they delivered a line, they'd smile at the end. And it was so inappropriate for this girl who, who was really suffering from traumatic stress to smile every time she delivered a line. And Carrie had none of that uh, conditioning, so she was perfect. And then they asked you to come and try out for the part. Had you done any acting before? No. Right? Apparently, the dark sets and menacing aliens didn't faze her much. She never acted again after Alien. <coughs> you okay? Actually, I'm a teacher. Um, I'm a mother. I have two children and just enjoying life. The rest of the cast was assembled on a budget. Filming was set in Britain, and the contract required hiring a quota of local actors. This brought Janet Goldstein and Mark Rolston, both Americans living in Britain, into the film. Despite having no prior experience with firearms or sports, Goldstein convincingly played Vasquez, a tough soldier. I've never shot a gun before. I'm actually frightened of guns, you know. When the recoil proved too much for her... It was either too little or too much. Gail Ann Hurd, an enthusiast of firearms, and Cameron's frequent shooting range partner stepped in to take the shot. And because I had actually fired quite a few guns in, in my life, I was able to, to get the recoil right. Al Matthews, another American expat, lit authenticity to Sergeant Apone. Let's go, people. They ain't paying us by the hour. Let's go. Hit them out. As a Vietnam War veteran with two Purple Hearts, he led the actors through a two-week military boot camp, teaching them how to handle weapons and act like special forces. It was physical. They went through maneuvers. They went through drills. Um, and Al was their sergeant. And they're handling it well. I mean, I have to put the boot in every now and then, but uh, that's how it goes. Absolutely badasses! Let's pack them in! Get in there! Have a seat. We'll do a commercial. We'll be right back with Paul Reiser. Nice job, Paul. Uh, what, what is the film now? That we're doing? Aliens. Oh, Aliens. So, with a zoo. Outer Alien. space kind of deal? Remember Alien? It's the sequel to Alien from about seven years ago. Yeah. Ooh, scary. Yeah. I couldn't now, even... What, what part are you? I play Herschel the Water Boy. No, I, um... <laughs> <laughs> Paul Reiser stepped out of his comic comfort zone to join the cast as Burke. Carter Burke. I work for the company. But don't let that fool you. I'm really an okay guy. Paul managed to showcase his acting depth while simultaneously earning the title of most unlikable guy in the galaxy. Uh, did you enjoy working with Paul? Paul has a nice smile, of course, but um, I, just, uh, I wouldn't want to go so far as to say that we, we got along in any way. <laughs> This is so nuts. I mean, listen, listen to what you're saying. Cameron's old pals filled out the rest of the ensemble. Lance Henriksen, who had done his cinematic time with Piranhas and Terminators, finally landed a significant part in Aliens as the android Bishop. You never said anything about an android being on board. Why not? It's just common practice. We always have a synthetic on board. I prefer the term artificial person myself. A major preparation for Lance was the knife trick scene. The scene itself served as an homage to John Carpenter's Dark Star, a film that indirectly inspired Alien. And so I practiced for a month. I mean, I split the tops of my fingers, learning how to really go fast. And so when I got there, I was ready. The idea to place his hand over Hudson's was the actor's own suggestion. Trust me. Bill Paxton, whose hand became an unintended co-star in that knife scene, had been in Cameron's orbit since being roped into painting sets for Battle Beyond the Star. Uh, I actually was his set decorator on a film uh, about four years ago. That's how we met. Cameron kept him in the loop, giving him a shot in The Terminator and a role in Aliens that leveraged Paxton's ability to personify panic. Okay, I'm on it. Hudson, just relax. <sighs> As for Michael Bain, he became Corporal Hicks by chance. 
Initially, the role was given to James Remar, who even began shooting in some of the opening scenes. However, he was dismissed due to creative differences. I got uh, into hash and there was some local heroin that I decided to try. And it wasn't a time where you got a friendly slap on the wrist and sent to rehab. They just got rid of you. Needing a quick replacement, Cameron dialed Bane. He said, like, uh, can you be here Monday morning to take over this role? And I said, like, yeah, absolutely. So I picked up a couple of quick scenes and got right into it and didn't have to go through all the marine marching exercises, you know. And... <laughs> Besides the intense boot camp, the Marines also had to dive into the novel Starship Troopers. Get comfy with futuristic weaponry. It's actually hard for me morally to justify being in a film with so many guns. I just find it very upsetting, and that's the biggest problem for me. I love shooting guns. That's like the best part of my job. And add personal touches to their gear, like naming guns and decking out their armor with lucky charms. I put my girlfriend's name on there. It was Louise. I think my gun in the background here, I called it my bitch. You could see the, you know, it says adios on the, on, the, on the gun. So I came in, they'd done all the rehearsals, and they had actually been shooting for a week, so I took that actor's wardrobe. And the only thing that really bothered me about the, taking over his role and, and, and his costume and everything is, of course, I wore his armor. It was a heart, and it was right over his heart, and I just thought, God, it just looks like a, something like aim. <laughs> you know, that's like, you know, like a bullseye, you know, where his heart is. That ain't so good. While the on-screen team brought color to the set, the real MVPs were behind the scene. James secured the support of two legendary designers, Sid Mead and Ron Cobb. Ron had previously worked on illustrations for Star Wars and Alien, and in the sequel, he helped refine Cameron's sketches. Sid designed futuristic vehicles for Blade Runner and Tron, and for Aliens, he designed the spacecraft that takes the team to LV-426. Cameron described it as a huge gun drifting through space, which Meade exactly brought to life. However, when it came to the dropship design to evoke Vietnam-era helicopters, Cameron stepped in, guiding the final design with his own sketches. Similarly, the power loader, an idea Cameron had previously toyed with in Xenogenesis, was brought to life using Cameron's detailed drawing. power loader was, I think, certainly our most challenging thing on the movie here. We decided to build a stuntman inside it so that when Sigourney was in it, she was actually standing with her back right up against the stuntman. Get away from her, you bitch! While Cameron had the option to collaborate with H.R. Geiger, the original alien designer, he chose instead to forge his own creative path. I guess maybe it was just my own ego as an artist. I just felt like he'd made his stamp, and I knew from what I'd read that he had to do everything his way. And I had a very specific idea for the Alien Queen to extrapolate beyond what had been done before. For the new creatures in Aliens, James teamed up with his Terminator collaborator, Stan Winston. When Winston first heard Cameron's pitch for a Queen alien controlled internally by two puppeteers and externally by 10 more, he thought Cameron had lost his mind. My second thought would be, yeah, we can do that. And within days, they had rigged up a fiberglass frame draped in garbage bags for a proof of concept. A trial run in the parking lot of Winston's studio quickly turned skeptics into believers. <laughs> okay, that's a cut. Eventually, the three meter tall queen, an intricate assembly of hundreds of parts and hydraulic system came to life under the control of 16 puppeteers. I like the queen, it's really great. I thought, I mean, it's can't, it, it will work also without me very well. Dangling from a crane and wired up with a spider web of cables, this animatronic marvel was maneuvered with car steering wheels off camera. This behemoth would later be celebrated as a landmark in animatronic technology, a title it is likely to retain given the shift towards CGI in subsequent years. And I think probably the Queen Alien is the only actress that ever could take direction from Jim Cameron and get pissed back and back him off. All right, and action! Besides the Queen, 
The film also starred many, let's call them standard xenomorphs. In the original Alien, the creature was portrayed by Balaji Badejo, a seven foot two Nigerian design student. For the sequel, Cameron needed a horde of aliens, but without an army of NBA scouts, recruiting a lineup of towering actors just wasn't going to happen. However, to make the height significant, the alien needed to appear in the same frame as humans, which rarely happens in the film. This realization meant that the height of the actors became irrelevant, allowing Cameron to employ acrobats and dancers with ordinary stature. Only six costumes were crafted, so scenes featuring alien attacks required some clever camera work and editing magic. The team also crafted dozens of alien dummies that were later blown up, crushed, and shot. Next, they upgraded the chest burster into an animatronic with limbs and designed face huggers. In the film, only two monsters attack Ripley and Newt, but 10 puppets were needed for the scene. Some moved their limbs, others moved around, and some were used in the shot where they jumped onto Weaver's face. Nine operators controlled the face hugger in the tube. Looks like love at first sight to me. And Bishop dissected a puppet made from cow and chicken parts. Magnificent. Human casualties weren't left out of the effects bonanza. A dozen human torso replicas stood in for actors in the goriest scenes. The Bishop android suffered the most. The poor prop was repeatedly hurled to the ground to achieve the perfect fall. In later scenes, its movements were manipulated with ropes yanked from off-camera. Don't worry, though. The android's blood is a mix of milk and yogurt. A dummy also doubled for Newt in scenes where Weaver had to make a quick getaway from the Queen's lair. Weaver couldn't carry the girl for long, so designers created a lightweight mannequin for wide shot. <laughs> And those planetary landscapes, buildings, and even clouds in the film's finale? All meticulously crafted miniatures. And hopefully the, the blend off between the full size and the miniatures is smooth enough that you don't always know what you're seeing. These mini marvels were so convincing that when the producers saw the first completed frames of the film, they thought about firing Cameron, mistaking them for budget-busting full-scale sets. Miniatures also appeared in unexpected places. Reduced copies of the Queen and the Power Loader were used for fight scenes that couldn't be filmed on set. They actually were, they had rods on their feet and we cut little slots in the floor and there would be a puppeteer under the floor sort of <laughs> making these things walk. Towards the end, we see the Queen laying eggs, a scene also shot using miniatures. The actual lair was created in an abandoned coal power station in West London. There are stairways there which have perforated grills and this look of when they're coming down into the bowels of it, we are descending into, you know, almost Dante's Inferno. Obviously, these things can be created in the studios, but it takes time and money. Before set construction could begin, the crew had to clear out heaps of asbestos. And we found out that it was actually healthier there after we'd mitigated it than it was in the sound stages at Pinewood Studios. Lamont also transformed a decommissioned aircraft tug into the film's most expensive prop, the armored personnel carrier. British Airways over at Heathrow do have these big towing vehicles. And at that time, they were just re-equipping all the, to the towing tugs with a new look. And we managed to get hold of one of the old ones that had six foot diameter wheels. Costing more than Sigourney Weaver's paycheck, this hulking piece of machinery was slimmed down from a hefty 75 tons to a more manageable 30. When funds ran dry before shooting the hypersleep exit scene, Lamont didn't flinch. He crafted just five chambers and cleverly multiplied them with mirrors, creating an illusion of a dozen Marines waking from their slumber. What? Is that a joke? Oh, I wish it were. 
The corridors, labs, colony entrance, dropship, and tunnels of aliens were all brought to life at Pinewood Studios, a place steeped in cinematic history with credits like James Bond and, and Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. You can't come in here. Back, back. It was here that Cameron was supposed to get his real taste of big time studio filmmaking instead. It felt more like a captain barricaded in his cabin during a mutiny. At Pinewood, unlike the usual practice where you rent an empty stage, you also got the local crew as part of the package. This crew treated filmmaking like clockwork factory jobs. They'd hit the pub for lunch and wrap up promptly at five, tea breaks included. That's a union regulation in England, so you're going to have a tea break. Whether you murdered the tea lady or not, there'd be somebody there the next day at the same time. <laughs> to them, Cameron was just some quirky outsider. Because I, I don't think they'd seen Terminator, and he kept trying to have showings, and none of them would go. Behind his back, they'd chuckle, dubbing him Governor and Grizzly Adams for his thick beard. Assistant director Derek Cracknell was particularly troublesome, often undermining Cameron's directions. He'd set up the lights and cameras his own way and took it upon himself to dictate the shooting of scenes. Having once been Kubrick's AD, he fancied himself more capable than this young American director. Yeah, right. Second team move up. I'll let Michael, Mike, if Michael watches and, and gets some going when he sees how okay. to here. You have a line of sight? Yeah, yeah. well, from over there. Yeah. The first AD. I mean, he kept, you know, he kept calling me love and sweetheart. People still that love. First time I walked on the set, the AD put his hand on my chest, and nobody ever touched me like that. You know, I could, you know, stop it. And I, I'm being from New York, I said to him, uh, if you ever touch me again, I'm gonna kick your ass. Things escalated when he convinced the crew to strike, a bold move that nearly derailed the entire production. Oh, hold on, hold on one second. This installation has a substantial dollar value attached to it. Cameron had promised the studio a quick shoot of just two and a half months. But the combination of pub trips and strikes threatened to blow that timeline. Jim could not relate to what was going on. It was like a, they were having a party, and Jim was at war to finish this movie. It was a war. In a decisive move, he fired Cracknell and replaced his main ally cinematographer Dick Bush with Adrian Biddle, who had worked for Ridley Scott, including on the iconic Apple 1984 commercial. After the cleanup, Cameron gathered the team and tried to find a compromise, promising more time for tea breaks in exchange for genuine help with filming. While the mutiny ceased, Cameron's speech before leaving the Pinewood set spoke volumes about the challenges he faced. This has been a long and difficult shoot, fraught by many problems, but the one thing that kept me going through it all was the certain knowledge that one day I would drive out of the gate of Pinewood and never come back, and that you sorry bastards would still be here. He was very specific about it. After filming finally concluded, it was time to head into the editing room, where Ray Lovejoy was already waiting. Lovejoy wasn't just any editor. He was the wizard behind Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Cameron was psyched to work with him, but quickly found that Lovejoy's methodical, almost leisurely pace didn't mesh with his own style. Cameron craved dynamic cuts, quick flashes of aliens, tight close-ups, and stark white blasts to punch up the explosions. Lovejoy, on the other hand, liked to let scenes breathe with long, contemplative pauses. The end product snagged an Oscar nod. Ray Lovejoy for Aliens. But little did the Academy know it was the result of a tug of war between director and editor. In the midst of this creative clash, composer James Horner was caught off guard. Just two weeks before his scheduled recordings with the London Symphony Orchestra, he was still waiting on the final cut of the film he was supposed to score. Oh, great. Wonderful. Shit. Horner had met Cameron during their time working on Battle Beyond the Stars. Although the Roger Corman School had trained him to work quickly, Horner hadn't anticipated having to write key musical themes overnight between orchestra sessions. And I only wanted the best score for him. And we sort of parted after that. It was very difficult. When the film was finally pieced together, it clocked in at a whopping two hours and 46 minutes. Far too lengthy for even the most patient of producers. Look, 
I can see where this is going. Consequently, all scenes from LV-426 before the alien onslaught, along with subplots about Ripley's daughter, got the act. And we went to the premiere. That whole thing had been cut out, and I was furious and so hurt because to me that was the whole point of the whole character was that she had this inside. These segments surfaced in the extended version years later. While Ripley was out cold in hypersleep, her daughter lived out her whole life and passed away, which explains the pronounced maternal instinct in Weaver's character that also seeps into the theatrical version. No, you don't. It's okay. You're gonna be all right now. Interestingly, Ripley's daughter was represented by a photo of Weaver's actual mother in the film. The backstory of Newt's family discovering the derelict ship from the first film also got trimmed. What is it, Dad? I'm not sure. These cuts brought the film down to a more manageable 137 minutes. Initially, the studio execs bemoaned even this length, but halfway through the screening, they knew they had a hit, not just financially, but as an actual cinematic gem. It's one in a thousand, really. The global premiere in July of 1986 was nothing short of a triumph. The film raked in 130 million worldwide not just thrilling the filmmakers, but also rescuing the studio from the brink of closure. Fox had changed owners several times over a few years and was constantly losing money. Cameron, however, played the role of studio savior. A decade down the line, Fox would place a whopping $200 million bet on his next epic. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Meanwhile, the sequel achieved the unprecedented it surpassed the popularity of the original, brought new fans to the franchise, and received seven Oscar nominations, a rare event for a science fiction film. For ages, the Academy had treated sci-fi like the fast food of film genres, but Aliens changed the game. The film for scored aliens, nods for James, James Horner's score, Ray Lovejoy's Lovejoy editing, aliens the bone-rattling sound, Sharp. and That's Peter Lamont's Peter set. Lamont's. The sound editing team grabbed an Oscar, as did the wizards behind the visual effects. We'd like to thank the members of the Motion Picture Academy, our producer, Gail Ann Hurd, and most of all, the creative genius responsible for it all, Jim Cameron. The crown and glory was the Academy nodding to Sigourney Weaver's stellar performance, a first for an actor in a sci-fi film. The sequel elevated her career to a new level, after which she no longer had to negotiate for a salary. I don't believe this. So that brings up Alien 3. I Well, again, I think they would have to twist my arm the next time. Um, but I, of course, I didn't think I'd do this one either, so... Uh... And we're fucked. Thus, Cameron gave Hollywood two hits in two years. He saved Fox from bankruptcy and received carte blanche for his next project. It was time to dive into the abyss. Just like Ripley, we'll keep on fighting. Don't let our channel get chest burst by the algorithm. Smash that like button, subscribe, and comment below.